Hey guys, this is Jan for Chess24. I finished playing my annual tournament, the Thailand Open. So it is time for another, what do we call these? Opening Clinic Special Thailand Edition, where basically I will go through my games from the Thailand Open with a focus on the opening and tell you guys what went well for me, what went wrong, what I expected to happen, what did happen, and that kind of thing. So hopefully you can get some insights into how a Grandmaster prepares for his games and approaches the opening. Even though not a very active Grandmaster in my case, because as mentioned, this is the one tournament I play. And if you're not, you should, because it is the best tournament out there. Shout out to Kai Turilla and his whole team, who once again put together a fantastic event in a new location. Without further spoilers, let's have a look at the location and move back to Thailand mentally. Here we go. This is me, round one, with the black pieces against Robert Kolman from Germany. As it often happens, you travel however far it is, 10,000 kilometers, to play a countryman of yours. I'm not really there, but this is the hotel in Thailand. I spent that morning in that very pool you can see behind me because the pairings weren't out and generally in the first round of an open you do rely on the 600 point rating advantage to do the business for you. With black I was not prepared against Robert Kohlmann but he played one f4 which is a thing I'm frankly happy to see in the first round. What you're afraid of is some solid mainline for white e4 or d4 well, f4 means that he likes to go his own way in the opening and that normally helps the favorite. So I went d5, knight f3, g6. There's many ways to play here after f4. Black, yeah, should really not experience any troubles. I think it's easiest, but you could argue about that, to play s in the reverse main lines of the Dutch. Go g6, bishop g7, and black is fine. The one thing I don't like doing against f4 play the move. First of all, because I think that this is the one theoretical line that one f4 player studies, study. And secondly, I'm not really sure black has enough compensation for the pawn in these things. Anything else is fine, however, in my book. I start with g6, not knight f6 to rule out some b3s. And I went on to get a pretty decent position quite quickly. Arguably g3, bishop g2 is a better setup here. But as I said, black is fine. Just play knight f6, c5, knight c6, castle. Take it from there. e3, bishop g7, bishop e2, knight f6, castle, castle. Queen to e1 looks aesthetically pleasing, so I can sort of understand the appeal, but it's not the way to fight for, not even an opening advantage, but actually for equality here already. After c5, d3, knight c6, we have some sort of theoretical lines with colors reversed, but I'd already rather be black. It's easy to play. You either go b6, bishop, b7, or you prepare an e5 break in the center, while the white kingside attack is still a little hard to manufacture. a3 was played, queen c7, intending e5, knight b2, e5, and I had, yeah, won the opening battle. I did not play all that well in the events to come, but for our purposes here after e4, d takes e4. Black is much better and I did manage to win the game, even though it's hard to use first round games as an indicator of form, but I wasn't very happy with the way I played. Then let's move on to round number two. I did win this game and in round number two, I was still a bit of a rating favorite against Akbar Akmalnaidi, I hope I'm not mispronouncing that too badly, from, I believe, Indonesia? Um, yeah, I think so. Young guy. I did not have any games of his in my database, which is good and bad. It was good, because once again, I got to spend the morning in this pool over here, but bad, because against teenagers who you don't know, you would like to have some clue what they're doing. I went knight f3, which nowadays is probably my default move when unprepared. Used to be 1d4, but now I think when unprepared I go 1 knight f3 a bit more often. He played d5, d4, knight f6, c4, and he took. This is the one line where, had I known this, I probably would have preferred 1d4, because against the queen's gambit, except it, playing this gives you some more options. The most prominent one being 3e4, which in my opinion is the most critical test. 
Still, after c4, d4, I played a line I had a look at recently. e3, e6 is what they do. Bishop c4, c5, castles, a6 is the main line. And here, the move b3, which has become very trendy the last two, three years, really. Doesn't look like much. Maybe it is not much, but white just wants to develop his pieces. Bishop b2, recapture on d4 with the knight or the queen. This bishop often goes back to e2, f3. The other knight goes to d2. And it's supposed to create some problems for black. The main move here is c takes d4. And after knight takes d4, white has been pressing a little bit in some recent games, like Giri Caruana, for example. But of course, it's not exactly winning for white. Caruana, in his last outing, played b6 against Blue Bomb in the Grand Chess Tournament. In this game, however, my opponent, without thinking for very long, went for b5, bishop e2. This is the point the bishop wants to end up on this diagonal. Bishop b7, bishop b2, knight bd7, knight bd2. I didn't know much theory after b5, but I sort of knew it was not supposed to be the main line because you can hit this queen side with a4 and create some weaknesses there. So that's what I did. However, already here I started having some th second thoughts. If I'm really better after b4, I still don't think I am, frankly. After castles, followed by rook c8 or whatever. C4 square is weak, but so is the C3 square, and I believe black is very, very close to equality. So B5 might be a better line than people, or than I have been giving a credit for. Instead, my opponent didn't play B4, but queen to B6. I went DC5, which is logical. Bishop takes C5. Now that this bishop had moved, I thought it was time. And here I committed a mistake. I played A takes B5, which I also thought was very logical. But after takes, takes, bishop a8, knight to d4, b4, white has absolutely nothing, as I had to realize. Knight c4 is where I play queen to b8. And to spoil away the result, I guess I'm going to have to tell you eventually, I didn't manage to get anything at all, and the game ended in a draw. I check now, and I don't even feel too bad about it. I didn't feel too bad after the game, because I felt like he just did nothing wrong. And if they do nothing wrong, you can't win the game. I've checked with the computer from somewhere here on. It's never more than 0-10 for me. And my opponent just played a fantastic game, defended very, very well. And a thousand moves later, it looked something like this. And draw agreed. So, theoretically, what I should have done is, in this position, instead of a takes b5, play knight to d4. Which I considered, but it wasn't obvious to me that with more pieces on the board, my chances would be better, and I wasn't sure if giving him this op extra option of e5, since b5 is not hanging here, was worth it. But this was the way to keep the game going. I'm not claiming much, but theoretically, it feels like this is what I had to try, because in the game, pieces look nice, just zero advantage here. So, draw in the second round against a much lower rated opponent, who played well though. Still, not a great sign. And my troubles, at least in the opening, would continue in the third round, where I faced Paul Griffith from England, but as far as I know, lives in Bangkok, regular there, in the Bangkok Chess Club that organizes this tournament. He went d4. For this game, I had prepared, but most of the games I had seen from him were from a while back, and if I remember correctly, he used to start more with e4. So after d4, knight f6, bishop f4. I was out of my preparation, not out of book, because recently everybody started playing d4, bishop, f4, the so-called London system, and I've been working on this opening series, which hopefully one day will come out, where I also had to cover this from the black side. Still, not what I had expected in this game. I went d5, the most standard move in this position, or the most natural move. c3, knight to c6, and knight to d2. This is the trendy new way to play the London, because after knight f3, nowadays it's quite well known that black is doing very well. After queen b6, queen to b3, c4. This line does not work as well after knight to d2, so black is at a crossroads here. Recently, in a tournament game, I had played bishop f5, which I considered to be a decent move, but I didn't want to repeat in case yet. Had a look at this and I went for the move that I was planning to recommend in my video series as well. e6. Looks a little passive, but black has been doing well with his approach to go e6, bishop d6, castle b6. And yeah, I was curious what he had up his sleeve. And it turns out he had something up his sleeve. He went knight f3, bishop to d6, main line, knight e5, and other things have been rendered harmless by now. Castles, bishop to d3. 
This is the position where Magnus Carlsen played a couple of games with bishop to b5, after which... Okay, I'll give you a free novelty. Bishop e7 is a very strong move. So I was hoping for this, bishop e7, playing knight to h5 or queen to b6. And I think black is doing quite well here. But he played the more natural bishop d3. I went b6, all of this is still known. The big point in these positions is... Okay, I shouldn't make this a lecture about this line. The big point is after e4, you always go bishop to e7, ignore this push, and after e5, you have knight h5, when this bishop on g3 is a little awkward. I knew this, but I didn't know his next move, which I would find out afterwards, has been played by Vladimir Kramnik, amongst others. So, some more homework to do here for me. Queen to e2, white is basically waiting for two moves for to see how black wants to put his pieces. Bishop b7, rook to d1. I went rook e8, which looked natural to me. Preparing e5, and now white went e4. All of this is still a game, I think, set luck against so that I was not aware of, but I played the way Wesley so also played. Bishop back to e7, the idea I told you about earlier. e5, knight h5, castles. My opponent blitzed out all these moves. Castles, I think, is more or less a novelty. They used to play a3 here. And yeah, I was a bit confused why he would blitz all this out. But theoretically, this position is fine for black. I went g6, rook f e1. And we have a complicated but absolutely acceptable position for black. One plan you could go for is c4, b5, tending to go b4. You could also play rook c8, half waiting move, and see what happens. You could even play the move I played, knight takes g3, h takes g. But what you should not do is play f6 here, which is exactly what I did. And this is pretty much a very serious blunder, because after e f6, bishop f6, I just completely missed his max move, bishop to b5. Which is very, very strong. Securing the d pawn, pinning my knight, and worse, I can't prevent him from grabbing this e5 square for his knights, which leaves me with a pretty useless light square bishop against two powerful knights. So after bishop b5, I was in serious trouble, and I didn't feel very good about myself. This f6 is just... A horrible strategic blunder here. If you go c4, followed by b5, or still rook c8, or a6. Black is okay, or king g7. Just play anything but f6. But I didn't. Fortunately, I was able to still win that game with a little help from Paul Griffith. I'll show you the final position, not because it matters to anything, but because I thought my last move was cute. It was some weird rook end game that probably was a draw starting. Um, but in this position, my pawns go this way. Many moves win, but I was quite happy with the one I played. If I go d1 queen, he goes rook takes e1, because f8 queen check would be met with king c6 check. But I can reverse the move order, start with king c6, and here white can't do much. If f8 queen, then d1 is pretty, pretty strong with mate follow. And if rook takes e1, takes f8 queen, queen d2 check, black forces, checkmate, or the exchange of queens when his remaining pawn will get the job done. So yeah, that's that's as much rook and rook and game expertise as you will see from me in this video. Anyway, not very convincing play by yours truly in the first three games. I will blame it on rust and not being very active. However, two and a half out of three is not the end of the world. In round number four, I faced Women Grandmaster from Mongolia. She's taught me how to pronounce the name, but I think I'll still make a mess out of it. Enktooth Altanuzi. She said we can call her Enki. That makes things easier. I did prepare for this game. I noticed she's actually a strong player. She won a lot of writing, recently has defeated the likes of Lawrence Trent and many good results against strong players. So I was warned, I saw that she likes to play the Banco Gambit against d4. And while I do think that in the Banco Gambit white has decent chances for an edge, I normally don't like going there, especially against slightly lower rated players, because it makes the first 20 moves easier for black and also defines the structure in these main lines that I feel it gives me less scope for hopefully outplaying opponents. So I more often than not like to go one knight f3 or one c4 against players that play the Benko. She played g6, which I was assuming during the game the idea was to get back into Benko territory after something like this. And I played a move order I played often. 
knight f3, g6, e4, intending yet yeah, to stop shenanigans like what I just showed you, and also intending to not allow any Grunfels. That's the main reason this knight f3, g6, e4 is often played. Bishop g7, d4, and c5 was played. Still similar to the Benko, but of course I don't have a pawn on c4. White is a choice here. c3 is a move, c4 is a move, dc5 is a move, knight c3 is a move, but I went for what I thought was the most principled this time around. I've played all kinds of other moves here, grabbing more space in the center by going d5. After d6, white once again faces us between knight to c3 and c4. I'm sure I've played knight c3 in the past. Even bishop b5 check you can make a case for. But this time around I thought, I felt like playing c4. My point was that I was still thinking she might transpose to the banco, but this would be a very good version for white up to cb a6. White goes a4, has not wasted any time on anything, and this is the dream version of the banco you can get. So I would have been quite comfortable playing that. Set knight d7 was played, which I don't think is a very good move, because it eliminates so many black options. It's very hard to ever play e6, since now d6 is hanging. It's hard to ever get bishop g4 in. So yeah, I didn't fully understand that move, and I went knight c3, and it turns out that her idea was to wait for knight c3 and take here. But I have a very hard time still do, believing that this is playable for black, because white controls the center of the two bishops. The black king will be slightly weakened now without this bishop, so I think this is a very good position for white. It's a bit similar to a line I used to play as black when I was a young man. I used to do this stuff, but here at least you fight for the e4 square. You go f5, knight f6. Objectively, this line is also supposed to be dubious, I think, after some quick e4, f3. But at least this line has some strategic merit. But the one in the game, I thought I got a very good position out of the opening, which I managed to sort of bungle. I show you one spot where I was a bit annoyed about myself afterwards, after whatever. More or less logical moves by both sides. I get, we get this position, but white is still much better. And I saw that knight takes a7 is probably very strong, but I thought, nah, let's be a professional, let's be boring, let's go knight f3, keeps my advantage. Why sacrifice pieces? This is the only way I could lose the game. All these kinds of thoughts. But I was a bit upset at myself, because I saw this line, like something like this, bishop takes f5, knight f8, and I thought it's probably breaking through. Actually, computer says bishop takes c8 is just as good. But I saw something like this and then decided no, too risky, which is a pity. I only play one tournament per year. If I have a chance to start a sacrificial attack that is good, I should probably do it. Um, but I didn't. I went back and then played a bad move. The next move, g4, ridiculous move. Queen d2 keeps the white advantage. So it turned into a bit of a fight, but in the end, in her time trouble, Thinly veiled back in this position after the time travel, where I'm more or less winning already. I th found a nice move for it, so I thought queen to e4. That decides the game on the spot. The bishop has to go and queen to a8. The white attack is devastating. Anyway, I won that game. Brought me to three and a half out of four, and to my great surprise, to board number one, because I was paired up against. Grandmaster Deep Sen Gupta, who started with 4 out of 4, and good news for me, I got the white pieces again. I was gonna get a lot of whites the next couple of games, which generally is nice. I did prepare for this game, Deep Sen Gupta normally prepares some version of the semi slav going d5 and e6, or the queen's gambit accepted. Therefore, this was not knight f3 time, but d4 time. But after d4, he, by going knight f6, followed by e6. Now after knight f3, d5, we could have transposed into Catalan or Semislav territory, but I had something else in mind for that game. So I went knight c3, which I thought with his repertoire would be more awkward, since he's not much of a Nimzo player, or hadn't played a lot of Nimzos. But he did play bishop b4, and I went queen c2, which is my main move here. I've done a video series about this, and that turned out to be a bit of a problem for me on the next move. After queen c2, he played d5, and in my video series, I recommend c takes d5, but I did not know, first of all, if he had seen it, and secondly, 
what he had in mind after CD5, because both ED and Queen D5 are major main lines. And if you're prepared for my recommendations here, then I thought it's probably not a great idea for me to go here. And said I chose the other main move, D5, A3, which I'm slightly less familiar with, but still I feel reasonably comfortable playing. Bishop C3, Queen C3, here castles is the main line that would transpose to the line I like to play myself with black. But Sengupta played another main line, very principled, knight e4, queen c2, c5, d takes c5, knight c6. In the old days I used to go cd, e d, knight f3, but nowadays this line is considered to be very, very acceptable for black. I don't even know how you play. You start with bishop f5, or you start with castles. Anyway, it's considered to be too risky for black, for white. When this position appears, white goes knight f3 immediately. Queen a5 check, bishop d2, queen takes c5, e3. Looks fairly harmless, and it is, frankly, but it's a line that always bothered me when looking at this from the black side and made me not go here. There's been a recent game that I sort of, well, we'll see in a minute how well I knew it, but I sort of knew of the game, Geary versus Adams, and I thought it was not easy to really equalize here, so it would give white some pressure. So, d takes c4 is the best move. If you don't go dc4, I will go b4, cd5, give black an isolated pawn. So, d takes c4, and here I could not for the life of me remember how you're supposed to take back on c4. This, more in my defense, was a relatively early morning round. Most of the rounds started at 2 p.m., this one started at 11 a.m. So, I'll blame it on my brain not working properly, which is untrue. I had a good night's sleep. I just couldn't remember. Anyway, c4 here. When, yeah, it's not much, but white can try to build a bit of an initiative. You go b4, bishop d3, and try to claim that the extra space, the slightly better minor pieces, give you a tiny advantage, which is true. But instead I went knight takes c4, not sure if I was still following the game, but I was very proud of myself since after some thought I had spotted that b5 does not win a piece for black, but instead weakens the position after b4 and white is winning. What I had failed to spot, however, I saw it the second I let my knight or attached my knight and let it go on c4. So it often happens when you wonder. What I had failed to see is that knight e5 is a very strong move, using this pin differently to exchange these knights. And without these knights, white really has absolutely nothing. This bishop, all he has to do is enter the game and we could shake hands. Now that wasn't really my plan and in order to keep the game going I went for queen e4 here fully aware that I had done something wrong. There's nothing else. Queen e4, queen c7, rook c1. It's just, it's just nothing. Bishop comes to d7 and a draw. So I went trying to sort of fight against bishop d7 but it's also not really an issue. What black could do here is to go queen b6, for example, defending this pawn, targeting this and preparing bishop d7, bishop c6. But I would get lucky because here Deep Sengupta missed one thing. He played queen c7 with the same idea to go bishop d7, bishop c6. But after castles, bishop d7, rook a c1. It turns out that bishop c6 is not a great idea because b5, which would give white a pretty significant. Now, having missed that is still not the end of the world, but he had to lose a tempo with queen b6. And psychologically, of course, it's unpleasant. You feel stupid that he had to play queen 7 then queen b6. Also, this extra move gives me some chances to develop an initiative. And I was able to... The computer still says it's nothing, but it felt to me like oh, I had some pressure here. And practically, I thought I played well and managed to keep that pressure. I went bishop d3, stopping him from castles. Rook d8, queen e5, now castles is allowed, but rook c4, some potential threats with rook h4, rook g4, bishop h7, and also the looming rook to b4. Still, the computer says all of this is nothing, but I thought I had gained an initiative and I would gain a very good position on the chessboard a while later. And went on to win that game in his time trouble. There were some more mistakes to be made. But overall I was happy with my, well, I was mainly happy with his blunder, really. I wasn't happy with my opening play, not remembering knight takes c4. 
or not spotting that knight takes, you don't have to remember everything, you can just see that knight c4, knight e5 is nothing, so you have to go bishop takes c4, no rocket science, but I caught a break there and went on to win that game. So four and a half out of five things were going okay last round. Next round I was black against a young international master from the Philippines, I believe, Paolo Bersamina. He played 1e4 and this game I decided to go e5. I had spotted, he didn't have that much experience in the Rui Lopez and I thought he was probably expecting me to play the Marshall, my main line, but I went for my Becca main line, which those of you who watch my banter blitz won't be surprised by because I play it a lot too. There's b5, bishop b3, bishop c5, but I had a feeling Paolo might not know his way around here all that well. And that feeling was confirmed after he thought for a while and went knight takes e5. Not a bad move, but if you want to go for this knight takes e5 followed by d4 idea, it makes a lot of sense for white to include a4 rook b8. It's just a better version and you lose absolutely nothing by doing it. So starting with this, I liked or I already thought that yeah, my opponent was not into details here. After d6, I was more or less out of book. I vaguely recall there were some lines with f4, knight c6, queen c3, bishop b7, e5, knight e4, and probably one of my files says equality here, queen e3, knight a5, something along those lines. But I didn't know much because knight takes e5 is not supposed to be critical. He played c3, castle. Oh no, I will start with c5, queen d1, castles. Yeah, we were both out of book here, but I like my position. Black is quite active. Now after f3, I took a decision that felt correct to me. I wasn't sure if it's correct practically, but I couldn't resist it. I played the move d6 to d5, pawn sacrifice. Dreaming my knight on d3, square that was weakened by the move c3. The reason I wasn't sure if I should be doing this is because I thought he might go for this. And here, with opposite color bishops and a pawn down for now, I wasn't sure if there were really any winning chances, but it looked too tempting to pass up. I was gonna play bishop f5, rook e8, rook d8, with this knight here, regain this pawn, and I thought there's probably still some pressure. Computer says 0, 0, which of course it should be, but I thought it's not a reason not to go d5. Instead my pawn played ed5, which I was happy to see, because now this bishop remains on the board, and after bishop f5, it's already quite unpleasant for white to play, or so I thought. I want to go, I want to put the knight here, I want to go c4, reclaim my pawn, and this is a tough position to play, so this opening went very, very well. I thought g4 was the best try here. The computer says it's not very good. Bishop to g6. I was calculating some weight lines like g4, bishop d3, f4. I was thinking about all kinds of nonsense like takes and h3, or what's the other line I was thinking about? I think. Knight f4, f8, knight takes e5, all kinds of very complicated lines, but apparently I can just go bishop g6 and g5, c4, and black is doing very well. So in the game bishop c2 was played, but here after takes and c4, I managed to establish my knight here, reclaim this pawn, and that's already a horrible, horrible position for white to defend. And I went on to win this game. And I should probably show you well, another thinly veiled brag, the final, it's not even a combination, it's just cute. I managed to collect some material over here. And after h3, knight to c2, I was sure his intention, well, you could resign because you're rook down, but I'm sure his intention was to play queen b3, regaining some material, but I did manage to end the game with checkmate. Rare honor, rook a3 and rook takes h3, checkmate by pinning. So, all of a sudden I found myself leading the tournament with five and a half out of six. And next game, who did I play next game? I think I played Wang Hao next game, the number one seed Chinese Super Grandmaster. Lost a bit of rating recently, used to be 2750. And yeah, things has lost some rating, but he's the guy who defeated me, I believe in the Thailand Open two years ago in round number eight. I was doing quite well. I played d4, I prepared for this game. He's mainly a Nimzo semi-slav guy, like Deep Sengupta, so I was revisiting some of the stuff I had looked at 
for preparing deep against Deep Sengupta, but Wang Hao decided to take me out of book instantly with one d6. And I wasn't sure what to make of this. d4, d6, the thing shouldn't go c4 because here after e5 is supposed to be quite alright. So normally I would go knight to f3, this is my main move, which I thought he probably wanted to play some goofy sideline. Something like this, or I don't know what he wanted to do, but I thought he was probably comfortable playing some stuff like this. But after d4, d6, e4, I thought I could take him out of book as well, and we would both be on unfamiliar ground, which with hindsight wasn't a very clever decision. First of all, I don't think I took him out of book, and secondly, it's probably not what I want to be get on unfamiliar ground against Wang Hao. So e4 was a bit of an impulsive decision, saying like, you want to bluff me by going d6? No way, I'll call you bluff, go to e4. But by doing that, I also bluffed myself. And here after knight c3, g6, I could not really decide. I'm vaguely familiar with a bunch of systems like this Austrian attack with f4, knight f3, or all kinds of bishop e3, and then h3, or f3 systems, but more like half knowledge everywhere. So in the end, I played a system I used to play in my childhood, but it's a quite harmless system. I went knight f3, bishop g7, bishop e2, castles, castles, which is not the way to refute the peers. In my childhood, everybody was playing c6, knight bd7, queen c7, e5, where I, yeah, at least knew my way around 20 years ago. But nowadays everybody plays a6, which is probably just a better move, preparing b5. I went a4. And here I was familiar with b6, but Wang Hao played the very natural move, knight to c6, now after a4. This knight can even go here. And I didn't really know what to do. Still not the end of the world, I played h3, which looks normal, directed against bishop to g4. He played e5, and I took... I don't think there's any other choice, really. d5, knight e7 is just a fantastic king's Indian for black, where... White is 1,000 tempi behind doing anything on the queen side. And yeah, I think that's just a mistake. And bishop e3 also doesn't look very appealing. Because after some takes and rook e8, white would probably have to go f3 to defend his e4 pawn. And f3 and h3 never mix very well because it weakens these dark squares. So d5 is more or less forced in my mind. And here after d e d e bishop g5, I was actually very confident. Because I thought, I'm threatening knight d5 and you can't really stop it. I thought it's a double threat. I was threatening queen d8, bishop f6, and then knight d5, and the direct knight d5, and I didn't see what he was going to do about it. The reason I believe I thought that was that I had recently played a game in a similar position in the Bundesliga, where instead of the setup I fear, I had the bishop on g2 and the knight on e2. Apart from that, it was more or less identical. So the bishop on g2 supported my knight jumping to t5. So there this stuff was good. And in the game he played the not very hard to spot move bishop to e6, stopping me from going knight d5. And I started, yeah, hallucinating a bit. Or I started talking to myself, I don't know. Things went wrong. If you miss such things in the opening, it's often a bad sign. Because bishop e6 just stopped me from going knight d5. Also Paris, my other big threat while developing a piece, so not exactly rocket science. Still, nothing too bad about this position. I should have played a humble move like queen c1, preparing to go rook to d1, stopping h6, and the position is roughly equal, but life continues. Instead, I played a move I'm even embarrassed to show in this video, because it's so dumb, but it often happens. You miss one thing, and then you do a ridiculous second thing, or a mistake rarely comes alone. I played bishop to e3. It would have been a playable move had the bishop come from here, but to go bishop g5 and then next move after bishop e6 to play bishop e3 is not something any grandmaster or any self-respecting chess player should do. I had some weirdo reasoning that now I'm threatening knight g5, therefore it's not really losing a tempo because his bishop on g5 would have to move or he would have to play h6. I was hoping for h6, now queen c1 with tempo followed by rook d1. But all of this is complete nonsense, because he can play the fairly natural move queen e7 when my big threat of knight g5 runs into rook a d8, queen c1, bishop c8, and black's pieces coordinate perfectly while mine are all over the place. So after queen e7, I'm actually worse. I had managed to bungle the opening fairly badly, and now it's much, much easier to play black. Rook a d8 is coming, knight d4 is coming, and I just have to sit there and defend. 
which is not very pleasant with the white pieces after however many moves we've made, 11. But what to do? At least I managed to <coughs> not auto-destruct immediately here and produce some moves. Then, however, I had the next blackout some moves later in this position where I'd made some moves. I'm slightly worse because of the earlier stupidity. But I went for knight to d2, which looked natural. I want to do something like, I don't know, bishop e2, bishop c4 for the knight on b3. But the moment I let my knight go on d2, I spotted that he can go bishop h6, which is once again more embarrassing since he, his last move was queen f8, which I didn't understand. So I decided to play knight d2, and now I spotted that he can play bishop h6, since I'm no longer controlling that square. And I did not see what to do. And I didn't see what to do, because there's not much to do, it's just a bad, bad position. These bishops get exchanged, the queen comes to b4, and I'm in trouble. So I was sitting there one how, was thinking for like 20 minutes here, and then to my incredible surprise, he did not play bishop h6. And so I played h6, also stopping himself from going bishop h6 in the future. Now I'm still worse, but I have the feeling this is another lease of life. <clears throat> and yeah, let's make a longish story short. I managed to survive this game after some more embarrassing moments. But in the end, it did end peacefully. We got some sort of end game, something like this, where I was still under some pressure. Not still, I was under some pressure again because I had managed to mess up perfectly. But I managed to find one in order to meet bishop takes b4, win knight takes e5. And after rook b1, rook c3, I have the little trick, knight to b6, when, however, he would take on b4. I have bishop d2, keeping my material. And if not, this knight gets to d5 or d7. Why, it's fine. So that game ended peacefully. Sort of dodged a bullet, but mainly played like a total idiot, which normally against a player of Van House caliber, you cannot afford. So I was happy with the result, but not with the way I played. That means where we at? This is after round seven. Six out of seven, I was sharing first with some other players, including our dear friend Nigel Short, and in round eight, I got the white pieces again. As I said, I was getting lots of white these rounds. Sometimes a Swiss system produces strange things like that. Against Ivan Rosen, a Russian 2600 Grandmaster, who I wasn't very familiar with before this tournament, but who left a very solid impression from everything I had seen. I prepared for him, I saw he was a what was he? A Nimzo Quindian Hedgehog type of player. And I did not feel like going for the Quincy 2 Nimzo again, since I had already sort of shown my hand there, or my lack of hand against Deep Sengupta. And, and in this game, I decide to play 1c4. I'm normally comfortable making that move when I feel my opponent's not gonna play e5, and Rosum did not have a history of playing 1e5. After knight of 6, I went knight c3. I saw he had some games with e6, when I would've been happy to play this 3e4 line. And after c5, uh, my plan was not to allow him to get a headshot. He seemed very competent handling these headshot structures that he would get, for example, after g3, e6, knight f3, b6. And I didn't want that to happen, and therefore I went for knight f3, e6, and here not g3, b6, but instead d4 immediately. c takes d, knight takes d4. When the big point is that if black wants to go for a headshot here, he has to settle for an inferior version, b6, e4. Or I think knight db5 is even stronger. It is not supposed to be great for black. Sometimes they go a6 here. But after a6, e4, we've transposed to some weird, what's this called, Taimanov line. Queen c7, a3. And this is also a good headshot. Not sure if I'm contradicting myself by saying I want to avoid a headshot. But now I want to play a headshot. I want to play a headshot that's good for white. But of course, Rosen was aware of that too and did not give me that chance. In this position, the main move used to be knight c6, which I think is very playable, but there's a recent trend to play d5 here, which unfortunately is also very playable. White has a couple moves, but he hasn't shown anything special. e3 has been tried, cd5, knight d5, bishop d2 has been tried, but I want to play something else. I want the move bishop f4, which I thought at least has some surprise value. It's not gonna refute the line for black either, but it at least has some surprise value, some direct ideas. When, yeah, the main line is knight to c6, then e3, or c takes d5, both playable for white. 
Another move that I had seen, I think it's a recent Grishu game, is knight bd7. Threatening e5, when white goes queen to a4. Instead, Rosen played a third move that I wasn't very familiar with. The move a6, logically enough, just stopping any knight b5 shenanigans forever. But of course, a little slow. I went e3, and now after some thought, which I was happy with, meant I had surprised him in the opening. He went knight bd7, threatening e5 once again. And I played queen a4, as on the other line. Looks strange, but white is just trying to develop very, very quickly, posing black problems before black finishes his development. And queen a4 stops e5 and threatens to go c takes d5. In some lines there's some funkiness with knight to b5. And long story short, I did not see any other decent move after knight bd7. Turns out the computer says this line is not great for white. I'm not sure I haven't checked at great depth, but the computer insists that queen b6 is a good move here. I had thought about queen b6 during the game. I wasn't trying to meet it with long castles just to develop even more quickly. But after long castles, apparently queen b4 is very, very playable for black. Challenging this queen and reintroducing the idea of going e5. So after queen b6, maybe there's other craziness that would have to be investigated further, like knight db5. But it seems like that is the way to go for black, theoretically. Rosom played a more natural move. He played d takes c4, bishop takes c4. Of course, I have to be a little careful here, since b5 is looming and e5 is always out there as well. But for now, both of these are not possible because of pins. And white has a bit of a lead in development. Rosom played bishop c5. What else? If bishop e7, I go bishop takes e6. After bishop c5, I spotted the possibility to win a pawn. I went bishop takes e6. Well, technically it's a piece sacrifice, not winning a pawn, but black should not accept this, because after fv knight e6, something like that. You can stop calculating here with a clear conscience and say, this is not going to work for black, because white just activates all his pieces well. The black pieces are all over the place. It's just not a good idea to do black. Instead, Rosen, who I'm sure had anticipated bishop takes e6, decided to castle, giving a pawn, but in return finishing his development. Well, I have to lose some time, because now the bishop really, well, one day it will be hanging. Now bishop d4 is a threat, and I have to do something about it. One weird thing here, According to the computer is the best move, but one weird thing is I did not spot that this was a legal move. I considered bishop a3, which doesn't make sense because of knight b6, but it did not cross my mind that the bishop can go here. Not sure why, but it's a bit strange. There's not that many options. I'm not sure how great this move would have been, but had I seen it, I would certainly have considered it. So I took bishop takes queen d1. Now white is a pawn up, but black has the two bishops and finished development. And the question is, can black generate enough compensation for the pawn over the next move or two, really? Because if I manage to castle where I go knight b3, there won't be a whole lot of compensation. So Rosum played bishop to g4. And this is a position that I'm kicking myself over with hindsight, because with very little thought, I played f3 here. The most natural move, and once again, the best move according to the computer, but I knew perfectly well what was coming after f3 and what did come, is that black was bishop d4, queen d4, e d4, bishop to e6, and this position, in spite of my extra pawn, my winning chances are very limited. With control over this d5 square and opposite color bishops, there's really not that much to do here. Probably a better technician than me would have posed more problems to black, but I was not able to really cause him any trouble, and the game ended peacefully not that long after or well many moves after but not that long time after we had something like this and white just has zero winning chances here so i feel that instead of f3 i should have made a different move maybe knight to f3 which i did consider and i thought it wasn't much after bishop to b4 which is probably true but still it would have kept more scope for playing for a win in my opinion than what i did this f3 move after f3 really the game bailed out quickly which is a bit of a pity by the way opening theory wise i probably should not have grabbed that pawn but i should have played knight b3 it was too tempting to grab the pawn but knight b3 is a move i actually considered felt too artificial after let's say bishop e7 with b5 still looming but this was the way to keep the pressure up 
the white is actually better here. Bishop back to e2 and the black pieces are a little clumsy. So this was probably the way to play for the next game. But who doesn't take on e6 when given the chance? Anyway, I drew this game as well with the white pieces. Not ideal. Nigel Short won his game, so he took the lead in the tournament. He had like 7 out of 8 and I was at 6.5. And, and because I was getting all these white games, of course I was going to get black in the final. So black against Gerhard Schiebler, it was German Grandmaster. As you can see, his rating not very high for a Grandmaster. I outrated him by almost 250 points. But I knew this was not an easy pairing. He was used to be around 2500. Then ever since he moved to Thailand full time, he's lost some rating. But he's a very, very solid player, especially with the white pieces. Very hard to do anything. And he was having a great tournament. Had defeated Niklas Huschenbeet in the last round. Was already winning some 20 rating points going into this game. So I knew things weren't going to be easy and I did not quite know what to expect because he can play pretty much everything. Knight f3, e4, c4, d4 were all in the database and I wasn't sure what he would do the last round in Thailand. This is my one complaint by the way. 9 a.m. is too early for a last round. That <coughs> last round starts at 9 a.m. so there wasn't a lot of preparation time. He went 1e4 in our game and I decided not to go for my usual e5 because I had seen that his default line against strong players, calling myself a strong player here, was the Scottish four knights, which is reasonably harmless but not what you want to face in a game that I consider to be more or less a must-win situation. So instead I decided to go for the Sicilian played c5. And Schäbler played c3. Very solid move, but not a move that has ever scared me away unduly from the Sicilian. My main line here used to be knight f6, e5, knight d5. But I had seen that Schäbler had won a game in this line the round before against Huschenbeet, and I had not had enough time to check this in great detail. So I decided to change and play d5, the other main line, e d5, queen, d4, queen d5, and d4. There's all kinds of possibilities here. Knight c6 followed by bishop f5 is a playable line. I used to play knight to f6 followed by bishop to g4. But for this game my strategy was to yeah, get out of book quickly and keep as many pieces as possible on the game, on the board. And I thought the approach best suited to do that was to just play e6, knight f6. If given the chance to play an isolated Queen's pawn position, I'd be happy to do that. But normally if you go e6, knight f6, white goes knight to a3, hinting at knight b5, and tries to gain an advantage in development. I can't say I'm an expert here, but I did know that both Peter Swidler and Magnus Carlsen have played the move queen to d8 recently, not committing the knight to c6 yet. And therefore, mm, keeping the structure more flexible. And I thought if I can get something like queen d8, then bishop e7, knight bd7, b6, bishop b7, short castles, that would at least suit my goal to keep a board full of pieces. And I did achieve that goal, knight c2. My guess is knight c4 is a bit more critical. This is a recent game. Adiban against Van Veli, and also Smurden against Carlsen. Knight c2, I went knight bd7, bishop d3, b6, castles. Here, opening-wise, maybe it's more accurate to go bishop d6 to stop his next move, to stop bishop f4. But I played bishop to b7, and after bishop f4, white is very solid, but I still managed to more or less finish development. Bishop e7, queen e2, castle, castle. Rook d1, queen to c8. Queen c8, not a move you really want to play, but it's worth getting the queen out of the d-file. Rook fe1, a6, and I was quite okay with this position. Board full of pieces, asymmetrical structure. Nothing too bad has happened. The bad news, however, was that I was not going to play very well in this game. So let's briefly go through it. He went knight e5, I went b5, so far so good. Takes, takes, dc5. Of course, my plan was not to blunder my queen, but I had seen that I had queen c6, threatening checkmate and recapturing this pawn. Black is doing perfectly fine. Queen to f1, and I played bishop takes c5, the most obvious move, but probably queen takes c5 is a better move. It's often fool's goal to have this bishop on c5 in these structures. It belongs on e7. And after queen c5, I believe, yeah, I would have gotten the game at least that I was hoping for. Not claiming black is better or anything, but it looks playable. I played bishop c5, sort of hoping he would not go knight to d4. But he did, and that's a good move. After bishop d4, I could, 
inflict him with an isolated pawn, which is why I was hoping he might not do this. But against the two bishops, I felt like this is really not a position that gives any winning chances. So I went queen to b6, knight to b3, this knight made it to better square, and my bishop had to go to e7 anyway. Queen e2, another decent move here. Yeah, I was still optimistic. I played rook a to d8, but I had underestimated his next move, queen to e3, which at least practically was very unpleasant for me. Because the best move, I think, is queen takes e3, but in this endgame, once again, I did not really see any winning chances for me. Should still have done it. You don't always need to have this quote-unquote winning chance, but sometimes you just gotta make the best move and take it from there. Play something like this with an equal position and see what happens. But I talked myself into keeping queens on the board, play queen c6, which I knew was not a great move because he has the very strong reply queen h3, covering g2 and targeting my pawn on h7, after which it's not a fun position to play because all the white pieces are coming into the game very quickly. Knight d4, bishop e5, rook e3, rook g3. Well, the black attack is not existent and the queen obviously is light years better on h3 than on f1. So I continue playing badly. I played bishop a8 directed against knight a5 and knight takes b7, but losing more time after, bishop, after knight d4. He could have gone bishop e5 to knight d4, queen b7, bishop e5. My position deteriorated quite a bit. g6 has to be done, rook to e3. Rook to d5 is a tactical mistake, but actually, practically, I thought it was a good move, intending to sacrifice the exchange on e5 in many lines, which we will see later, but it was a blunder. I had seen this line, bishop f6, bishop f6, bishop e4, which looks like it's winning the exchange, but it's not because of e5, using this pin, bishop d5, queen d5, and black is winning. But somehow I had managed to not see this move, which the point is I should have seen it because I saw all kinds of tricks connected to queen takes h7 followed by rook h3 checkmate. Let's say <clears throat> something like this I was very very aware of. <clears throat> but somehow it still didn't cross my mind that he could go bishop e4 and if knight takes e4 queen takes h7 followed by rook h3 checkmate. Good news for me is he did not see it either. If he had played bishop e4, I would have had to play something like h5 and pretend to, that this was part of the plan. Maybe there is still some compensation for the exchange, but obviously black is in trouble. Instead, rook d e1 was played, and now I still gave the exchange, but on my terms for the stronger bishop, I went rook takes e5, rook e5, bishop d6, rook e2, queen c7. And while I wasn't happy with myself, I still felt that practically this was a good decision. The white attack is over. And I thought I have almost full co compensation for the exchange. Maybe some knight h5, maybe some b4, maybe some rook d8. Who knows, I thought this was a playable position and Schäbler did what I thought was a decent practical decision. He had very little time left, forced a move repetition here and I had no real way to avoid it either. So this game ended peacefully and while I'm not happy about the result, I can't really claim that I had any winning chances or I deserve better. Au contraire, I kind of, yeah, needed some help to even get that draw. That brings us to the end of the tournament. I finished with 7 out of 9, but not winning that last game meant that I did not manage to catch up with Nigel Short, who went on to win the event with seven and a half out of nine. Here we have the final standings. Congratulations to, oh, sorry. Congratulations to Nigel, who I think has now won three out of the last five or six Th Thailand Opens. I won on my first outing there in 2011. Haven't managed to repeat since. Actually, even had I won the last game, I think Nigel would have had the better tiebreak, but still would have been nice to, you know, get this extra half point. Didn't happen. I, my Buchholz guys let me down a little bit. I felt like starting with five and a half out of six, my Buchholz couldn't have been that bad. But in the end, I finished shared second till fifth with the worst Buchholz, so fifth. Um, so yeah, I'm, I have mixed feelings. I'm not too disappointed. I did win rating. I won like 3.1 rating points, which doesn't means it can't have been a terrible tournament. But getting all these white games and then, yeah, a uh, lower rated opponent in the last round, I feel like would have been nice to score that extra point, that extra half point, let's say. 
But I didn't match, and I can't complain too much. The game against Wang Hao wasn't very good. Against Rosum, I didn't get match. Against Schiebler, I was under pressure. So the result is quite okay. Still, eh, so close. After five and a half out of six, of course, I had higher hopes. Anyway, it was a fantastic event, as always. If you're not playing there, you're really missing out. Congratulations to Nigel. Thanks for everybody who's involved in organizing the thing. I'll be back and I will continue chasing that tournament. Opening-wise, this is an opening cling after all. I don't think it was a great success because, yeah, I didn't manage to put much pressure in most of my white games. Like the draw in the second round against Akmal Naidi, then against Van Hao, I managed to be worse with white out of the opening. Against Rosum, okay, there I put some pressure, it wasn't quite enough. Against Sengupta, I got absolutely nothing and needed his cooperation. So, yeah, my wide openings left a bit to be desired, but business as usual, I can't complain too much about either. It's not like I got into any trouble out of the opening. That was it. I hope you enjoyed it or learned something or something. I hope you watched it. Thank you, guys, and see you next time. Bye.